Okay, hi, and welcome to today's webinar as part of our Advancing Your Research webinar series. Today's topic is incorporating feminist practice into your research. My name is Kelsey Cheshire. I am a behavioral and social sciences librarian here at Cabo Library. I work specifically with our School of Social Work as well as our Department of Sociology. And my name is Hilary Miller, and I'm the scholarly communications librarian here at BCU Libraries. And I'm Patty Sobzak, Collections Librarian for the School of Business, the Wilder School, and the Department of Political Science. Great. Uh, so we have a large group of attendees today, so please let me know that there's going to be time at the end for us to take your questions. We will have someone monitoring that chat box, so feel free to chat us any questions that you may have. You'll find the chat button near the bottom of your screen, and most likely it will open up on the right side of your screen. With that said, let's start. So we've come up with several goals for this webinar. Number one, we just want to raise consciousness. When you're a student, you might not be aware that it's totally acceptable to assimilate your personal beliefs as a feminist into your research. Even more than being okay, it can be a strong methodological choice to do such. We hope you'll leave feeling more comfortable with that approach. Secondly, we're going to talk about decision points a lot, places in your research process where you can choose to incorporate feminist ideas. You should be able to take small steps if you'd like at the beginning or the end or even the in-between, and hopefully you'll find ideas regardless of your subject area. We've tried to give examples across the disciplines. And lastly, we hope you enjoy these real world examples we'll give you. It's all about offering some inspiration for you moving forward in your research. Before we get too deep into this webinar, we would also like to acknowledge that we are three white cisgender librarians. So we wanna acknowledge our many unearned privileges, which not only shape our ability to present this information, but also we remain indebted to our colleagues and scholars of color who have shaped our understanding of these issues. With that, let me pass the mic to Hillary, who is going to introduce us to feminist research. All right. So what exactly is feminist research? Is it any research that's done by feminists? Is it research that focuses on the experiences of women? Or is it any research that investigates the influence of gender on any research or topic, uh, research topic or question? All of these are ways that feminist research has been defined, but there isn't actually a single definition. Depending on who you ask, it could be any or all of these things and much more. Feminist research practice is informed by a number of concepts from feminist ethics and theory, and these can be applied in any combination to produce research that is feminist. So if you ask, is my research feminist? The answer isn't necessarily yes or no. The better question might be, how feminist is my research? Or what are the ways I practice feminism in my research? So let's look at some of the ways you can do this. First, feminist researchers look beyond privileged male viewpoints to specifically seek out women's knowledges and experiences. Feminist researchers know and value that their research participants have expert knowledge about their own experiences. Seeking out and valuing the knowledges and experiences of women can help guide the selection of your research questions. Once you know what population or community you want to focus on in your research, what, according to them, are the most pressing research questions that need to be answered? Feminist research also challenges the dominant Western notion of objective knowledge, or the idea that research and science can be truly objective, or that it's possible for a researcher to approach their work from a truly neutral and objective viewpoint. As feminist researchers, we can engage in the practice of reflexivity to help us understand the subjectivity of our own viewpoints. Reflexivity is a term used to describe a process where we increase our self-awareness by identifying our cultural assumptions and biases. And then we engage in an ongoing reflective process to understand how these impact our research. And related to this is this concept of situated knowledge, which was introduced by Donna Haraway. And she said that all knowledge is produced by individuals who are situated in a particular place. So their particular context, 
their viewpoint, and their biases all influence the knowledge that they create. And she highlighted how a claim of objectivity and neutrality in research is in many cases a veil for a very specific viewpoint, one that's white, cis, heterosexual, and male. And she further stated that by understanding and openly acknowledging our own experience, context, and our place within the world, or our situated knowledge, we can individually and collectively achieve a greater objectivity than we could if we were to simply ignore our situatedness. So alongside the process of identifying and acknowledging our situated knowledge, as feminist researchers, we also identify and acknowledge the power we hold. Feminist researchers question the power dynamics in a given research context, and in particular, the power imbalance that's inherent in the traditional concept of the researcher versus the research subject. As researchers, we can hold power over research subjects. Power can be used in negative ways, even unwillingly and unknowingly. So it's critical to be aware of our own power. One way for us to begin to understand power dynamics is to explore our positionality. Positionality describes a researcher's position in relation to the research context or those who are the subjects of the research. It asks the question, what is my relation to the participant community? Am I an insider, an outsider, or some combination? Positionality applies across all kinds of dimensions. So you can be an insider on some dimensions, like gender, and an outsider on others, like race or class. The closer you are in position to the community or the individuals who are participating in your research, the more likely it is that you're going to have shared expectations and intentions about that research and power equity. Once we understand the power dynamics, feminist researchers seek to remove power imbalances by empowering the research participants to be partners in our research process instead of only subjects of the research. And later we'll look at a specific example of how this can be done through the methodology of feminist participatory action research. In recognition of the many dimensions that make up each individual person, feminist research is also intersectional. It questions how gender intersects with all other forms of oppression, including oppression based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, ability, class, or age. And the final point I want to make about feminist research practice is that it is motivated by a desire to make positive change in the world. We do feminist research in order to achieve social justice. Feminist researchers move beyond only theory into practice, or sometimes people will use the term praxis, feminist praxis, as the way that feminist theory is fulfilled in action. Okay, so now that we've explored what feminist research practice is, how do you actually do it? Before I give some examples of how feminism can be applied to research methods, I wanna share a few important reminders. First is that there is more than one way to do feminist research, way more. And it isn't all or nothing. So any of the concepts I've mentioned so far can guide the design and the implement implementation of your research. Feminism can also be incorporated at any stage of your research process, from developing your research question, to designing and then undertaking the research, up to interpreting the results. And feminism can also guide the way that you share your research findings, whether that's through traditional means like scholarly articles, or in ways meant to share your findings directly back with the participants or the communities you engage in your research. Similar to this, there's no single feminist research method. Feminism can be incorporated into any kind of research method. It's also important to remember that it's okay to question the traditional research approaches. Um, as a feminist researcher, you should consider what methods are best for the context of the research you're doing, and also be open to combining multiple methods when appropriate, rather than just sticking to the method that's traditionally considered the correct one. One final note before we move on to methods, I'd like to acknowledge the barriers that feminist researchers can face. I wanna do this so that you know that if you face them, you're not alone in this. And if you can't overcome them, you're not a bad feminist. 
Jennifer Brayton, Michelle Olivier, and Wendy Robbins in their brief introduction to feminist research also make sure to include this point, and I'll read directly from them from here. While feminist researchers can strive for the ideal feminist research process, there often exists a large gap between the reality and ideal goals of doing feminist research. While a desire may be to promote equality in the research process through the validation of women's experiences and to enact social change and transformation, many, many barriers confront feminist researchers from achieving these aims. And they go on to underscore that, like we've said, the research process is made up of a large number of decision points where you might see conflict between your own commitment to feminist practice and the outside forces that might work against them. Some of the outside forces that they mention include academic institutions where researchers are enrolled or employed, external research funders, organizations or individuals who might have a stake in the research process and outcomes, publishers, or even the research team itself. Before I move on, here are my references for the Defining Feminist Research section. Now that we've looked at some of the ways feminist ethics and theory apply as core concepts of feminist research, let's look at some specific examples of ways that researchers have applied feminism to their research design and their methodology. So our first example comes from the quantitative method of survey research and combined with the use of focus groups. So survey research is conducted by using questionnaires to gather data about some particular phenomenon. And that data is coded into a numerical format and then statistically analyzed. By using focus groups, your survey design can be informed by the perspectives of those who are representative of the participant population. So taking this step early in the design of your survey helps you select appropriate vocabulary and phrasing for your survey questions. It can also help identify and remove any assumptions or bias that you have that might impact your choices. It can also help you expand your own situated knowledge about the population that you're going to be engaging with in your research. And it can also identify issues that you as the researcher might not even be aware of. So the approach of using focus groups to inform survey design is going to be particularly useful for cross-cultural survey research too, where your approach may need to vary across the multiple cultural contexts of those who you're going to be surveying. Here is an example of feminist survey design in action. While studying AIDS-related behaviors and attitudes in 1999, Catherine Quina and her colleagues held focus groups with women who had attained low levels of formal education who gave feedback about the draft survey. Their feedback helped improve the format, content, and the readability of the survey. And they also shared how the survey affected them emotionally, as well as how truthfully they responded when they took it. And this helped the researchers redesign the survey to be more sensitive to those taking it. Uh, particularly because some of the questions that asked for information that was highly private and at times even painful for them to share. As, uh, as the researchers here said, this process allowed the population of interest to participate in the research process and have a voice in the research. These are aspects that are central to feminist methodology. To start this next example of a feminist research methodology, I'm going to define first what participatory action research is. Um, participatory action research is what happens when formally trained researchers, like graduate students or faculty at an academic institution, collaborate with stakeholders from local communities to do research that's specifically designed to create knowledge and drive action and ultimately help a community solve its own problems. This means that community stakeholders are full partners at every step of the research process. So from selecting the research question all the way to sharing this research findings. And participatory action researchers also work to correct power imbalances, and in particular the imbalances in how knowledge flows to and from the community whose problems are being researched. In particular, they work to avoid what is an unfortunately all too common occurrence of research that is extractive. So in an extractive process, re process, researchers swoop into a community to do research on that community, 
Often they're relying on the unpaid labor of participants who hope that their participation is gonna to lead to positive change. But all too often the research findings are written up and published in academic journals and they become part of a scholarly conversation that isn't accessible to the community. The findings of the research might be shared back with the community, um, but in a way that doesn't help them take action, or they might not be shared back at all. And as a result, the community doesn't see much or any direct benefit from participating in the research. So in contrast to this, participatory action research is done in the community, with the community, and for the community. So you might be thinking at this point, hey, participatory action research actually already sounds pretty darn feminist, and you're right. Um, feminist participatory action research blends participatory action research with all of those core concepts of feminist research that I shared earlier, and they really are quite a perfect match. So an, uh, an excellent example of this kind of research in action comes from uh, two university researchers, Holly Scheib and M. Brinton Likes, and they partnered with um, African American and Latina women who were community health workers in New Orleans after Katrina. Um, these community health workers felt they needed to document their personal and professional challenges after Hurricane Katrina. Um, in terms of their positionality and their situated knowledges, the women on this research team crossed different classes and races, languages, cultures, and nationalities. And then before they began to work within their community, they first spent time getting to know each other to better understand the diversity of the viewpoints that they brought to the project. And they also made collective decisions from the start about the design of the research project. And on top of that, they were paid to participate in the project. So throughout this project, the community health workers were creating photo texts. Uh, photo text is just an individual image with an individual story tied to it. And they photographed each other in day-to-day -day work, images of the after effects of Katrina, um, images of unhealthy challenges in their community, things like evidence of violence or billboards that were promoting junk food or alcohol. They selected photo texts and wrote the accompanying stories and ultimately created collective stories to promote healthy living in their communities. They shared these with their own community health organizations, conferences, and with New Orleans residents at events like community markets and festivals. And you can see snippets of some of their project posters on this slide here. So while the university researchers produced a traditional journal article as a result of this research project, the core production of knowledge that happened was through the photo texts and the collective community stories. And these were created by the community and for the community. As the researchers put it, through creatively voicing their concerns and understandings, through images, storytelling, and critical analyses, women recognized themselves and were recognized by others as knowledge producers and contributors to responding to post-disaster post -disaster challenges. And as a result of this research, the women also increased their own cultural awareness and empathy and their ability to recognize and respond in the future to structural health issues that they were facing in their communities. So here are my references for this section on feminist research methods. And now I will pass the mic back to Kelsey. Thank you, Hillary. So for this next section, uh, I'm gonna be discussing what is known as feminist citation practice. I think this is a great, easily doable way to incorporate your beliefs into your research, particularly when you're writing or presenting or even just starting to understand your research area. Now, before we get into that, let's talk about what we know about authors and citations, because I think that will help us understand the importance of feminist citation practices. If you're currently a student, you've probably been told that citations are just to avoid plagiarism, but this is much more than avoiding plagiarism. Specifically, citations can determine who participates in research, how they participate, like their labor and their contributions, and all of that comes together to measure how they are rewarded with their credit and capital. So who gets to be an author literally changes how the scholarly communication system works. 
let's start by discussing some fascinating research conducted by a scholar named Cassidy Sujimoto and her team. So Cassidy is a professor of informatics and her research explores the formal and informal ways in which knowledge producers consume and disseminate scholarship. One thing that we've learned from her research is there are clear gender differences in the disciplines. And let me note that they operated with a gender binary, so I'm reporting the findings based on that same binary. Okay, so the gender differences come into play when we consider who is producing the scholarship. Across the board, in the humanities and the hard sciences, uh, we see that men are more likely to be authors of journal articles. The only subjects where we see women outperforming men are in fields like nursing and social work. We often call those the care disciplines, and it should be noted that they're seen as lower in the academic hierarchy. Now we consider the production disparities, and Sujimoto found that across the board, women are cited less often than men. So it doesn't matter the discipline or what journal they published in. Then they analyzed the roles that women played in the production of the scholarship. And they found that men overwhelmingly have access to the resources necessary to produce scholarship, while women tend to be uh, the hands of science. This means that women largely perform the experiments while men are writing the article, they're designing the experiments, etc. Uh, now it's easy to imagine what those findings might look like if we considered other variables like race or sexuality. All of this is to point out that citations are very important. Being cited less means you have less credit for your work and less social or academic capital. And if you go into academia, this is so important for your career. That's just one aspect though. Even more importantly, citations reflect how knowledge is reproduced and remembered. How our histories are narrated and by whom. So I think it's really important to say this, and I want you to know that despite this, whether you're a woman or an underrepresented minority, your work and your contributions are valuable. And you have to remember that as you produce knowledge. So we have several movements for change that are happening to correct these issues, uh, such as hashtag black, cite black women, and in a broader sense, feminist citation practices. So let's discuss what feminist citation practices are. We'll start by uh, discussing Sarah Ahmed, who is one of my favorite feminist scholars. She has a book called Living a Feminist Life, and I want to quickly read her introduction to her citation practices rather than summarize them. So Sarah writes, in this book, I adopt a strict citation policy. I do not cite any white men. By white men, I am referring to an institution. My citation policy has given me more room to attend to those feminists who came before me. Citation is feminist memory. Citation is how we acknowledge our debt to those who came before, those who helped us find our way when the way was obscured because we deviated from the paths we were told to follow. We cannot conflate the history of ideas with white men, Though if doing one leads to the other, then we are being taught where ideas are assumed to originate." End quote. So there's so much to unpack there and so many wonderful takeaways. I hope that you also found that uh, passage inspiring and insightful. And if anything, next time someone is bothered uh, that you're criticizing white men, you'll be able to clarify that you're referring to an institution and dare them to clap back. I think a fellow librarian, Eliza Elkin, does a great job summarizing the concept. She said, when we write, we put our voices into conversation with others, but when we cite, we decide who gets to be part of that conversation. So with that in mind, what does feminist citation practice look like? So Carrie and Daniel are both geography scholars, and how cool is it that even in geography, people are doing feminist research? Uh, they refer to feminist citation practice as conscientious engagement. The idea that as a scholar, you should examine your sources and almost count who you're citing. 
So that's not to say that we are to quantify diversity. As they point out, there's not much you can know from a name, uh, but it does encourage you to learn about the people you're citing and pay closer attention to whose ideas you're carrying forward and what power dynamics you might unintentionally reproduce. So just to summarize, uh, when you discuss feminist citation practice with others and they might think it's silly or too time consuming, just remind them how important it is to be concerned about the political nature of citations because it is related to, compounded, and reproduced by other concerns we have, including microaggressions, hiring practices, and uneven distributions of labor. And really quick, here are my citations for this section on feminist citation practices if you'd like to dive further into these issues. Now I'm gonna pass the mic to Patty. Thank you, Kelsey. I'm going to spend the next few minutes sharing with you some thoughts about research production from a feminist perspective. My inspiration for sharing about this is from an article entitled, For Slow Scholarship, A Feminist Politics of Resistance Through Collective Action in the Neoliberal University that discusses the importance of slow scholarship in terms of feminist research practices. Slow scholarship can be defined as thoughtful, reflective, and the product of rumination. It's kind of a field testing of other ideas. The concept was actually drawn initially from the slow food movement. The slow food movement started in 1986 in Italy as a cry for the slowing down of the pace of life to find more time to spend together. While the label slow scholarship is relatively new, in the lexicon of academia, its foundations can be tied to the work of Ernest Boyer in his seminal report written for the Carnegie Foundation in 1990. In it, he emphasizes the importance of intentional and intellectual thought in teaching and the teacher as scholar and also as learner, and explored how the use of faculty time is rewarded and especially what activities of the professorate are most highly prized. Boyer's groundbreaking report shed light on the need to understand the connection between teaching and research and the struggles experienced by teaching faculty in meeting the accelerated research timeframes and outputs of the neoliberal university. Now, while there is no universal definition of a neoliberal university, for the purposes of our look our our talk today it really is a term which refers to the coordinated efforts by capital and financial interests after the 1980s to privatize public institutions and deregulate markets inspired by boyer's work scholar kim england built upon his ideas and concluded that feminist and post-structural challenges to objectivist social science demand, demand greater reflection by the researcher with the aim of producing more inclusive methods sensitive to the power relations and field work. England's work set the standards for including personal reflexivity and considering the role of self in the research journey and recognized that clearly Researchers cannot conveniently tuck away the personal behind the professional because field work is personal. The formation of slow scholarship inspired researchers Hartman and Darab in their article that calls for slow scholarship as a response to the acceleration of academic work, discussing in particular the implications of this intensification for pedagogy. And they frame intellectual freedom as really the freedom to think. They provided recognition of these issues that advance a call for the practice of researcher self-care that aligns itself with the growing movement of slow scholarship lacking in the current neoliberal university. In 2015, Mounts and her collaborators wrote the article I mentioned earlier for slow scholarship. This article written by a group of geology professors furthers the call for slow scholarship as a much needed approach to research in neoliberal universities. The authors argue that slow scholarship is from a feminist ethics of care and then cultivates collective challenges to the elitist exclusion. For them, slow scholarship is about making the university a place where many people, 
professors and students from multiple place of privilege and marginalization can collectively and collaboratively thrive. Feminist ethics of care really directs our attention to the need for responsiveness and relationships, paying attention, listening, responding, and the costs of losing connection with oneself and with others. In their efforts to challenge the academic systems, the same group of scholars that form, the same group of scholars that wrote the article formed the Great Lakes Feminist Geography Collective as one attempt to reflect on many of these challenges they seek to change. Their contribution is to cultivate an explicitly feminist and collective model of slow scholarship. Feminist scholarship provides important insights into uneven power relations and the gendered context of university policy and environments. So slow scholarship is really not just about time, but really about structures of power and inequality. And then a feminist mode of slow scholarship works for deep, reflexive thought, engages research, joy in writing, and working on concepts and ideas driven by our passions. The authors provided 10 suggestions on how to incorporate slow scholarship into daily practices. Of the 10 suggestions, these four stood out to me. First one is count what others don't we can recognize the value of collective authorship, mentorship, collaboration, community building, and the activist work in the germination and airing of ideas. Take care. A feminist ethics of care is personal, individual, and collective. We must take care of ourselves before we can take care of others, but we must take care of others. Make time to write differently. Writing is a fundamental mark we make in the world as academics and should reflect the values inherent in the life of mind, rigor, engagement, nuance, critique, making a difference. And lastly, reach for the minimum. For example, good enough is now the new perfect. Reaching for the minimum allows for focus on quality, not quantity, and acknowledges the need for balance in our lives. In conclusion, in conclusion quoting from Boyer's report, the most important obligation now confronting the nation's colleges and universities is to break out of tired old teaching versus teaching versus research debate and define in more creative ways what it means to be a scholar. And for those who are interested, there's a list of references to this part of the webinar. And now I'm going to pass the mic back to Kelsey. All right, thank you, Patty. Um, I'm now going to introduce you to feminist data visualization, which is a newer concept I've learned about. Uh, but before we explain feminist data visualization, let me clarify what data visualization is in case anyone isn't familiar with that term. So data visualization is basically mapping your data in a visual space. Things like graphs, charts, maps, you can visualize your data for communication or analysis or discovery purposes. It's about allowing your data to tell a story to others. Visualization becomes important because data can't actually speak for itself. Visualizations, though, aren't self-explanatory. Charts can lie. Uh, they can be used to show false correlations, for example. So, here we see the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates with the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in. And while that looks like a strong correlation, I think we can all agree those aren't related at all. So there is a website called Spurious Correlations where you can see many more examples like that if you need a laugh later. So let's now take the idea of descent and apply it to data visualization. I think it can quickly become apparent how important it is that we devise ways that we can talk back to our data that we collect or visualize, that we question the facts that may be shown through visualization, and even ways that we can present alternative views or realities with our data visualization. So Jason Moore is a data scientist and he came up with a Hippocratic Oath for data visualization. And while it's very dramatic sounding, I think it is a solid idea for how we approach visualization. So Jason said, I shall not use visualization to intentionally hide or confuse the truth which it is intended to portray. I will respect the great power visualization has in garnering wisdom and misleading the uninformed. 
I accept this responsibility willfully and without reservation and promise to defend this oath against all enemies, both domestic and foreign. Amen. And so then to build off of this concept of resp responsible data visualization, it is very easy to see how feminist theory can be applied as well. So two other data scientists, Catherine Dignazio and Lauren Klein, have explained how to apply feminist theory to influence the information design process, as well as the visualizations that we put out from that process. And they came up with six guiding principles for feminist data visualization. Number one is to rethink binaries. So a great example that we're all familiar, familiar with is the false binary of male or female. But we can also think about concepts like reason and emotion or subject and object of the study. This pulls down to how can you register responses that do not fit into the categories we provide? Number two, embrace pluralism. With that, we can think about self-disclosure and moving away from an emphasis on objective presentations, but rather acknowledging multiple truths. Number three is examining power and aspiring to empowerment. So how can we connect back to the communities that we study? How can we distribute power within our teams? Can our visualization empower the end user? Number four, consider context really applying the idea that knowledge is situated and applying context to yield more informative visualizations. Uh, number five, legitimize embodiment and affect. This leads to considering really interesting ideas about visualization, such as could you create a data mural or data sculptures or even quilts to visualize your data. And lastly, number six, make your labor visible. As much as we focus on the technical aspect of data collection, also focus on the human element, like who collected the data, who's cleaned the data, who's maintaining the data. This helps with attribution and credit like we discussed earlier. So I realize this is a lot in the abstract. So let's talk about an example of feminist data visualization now. This is a screenshot of a website called Native Land Digital. It is a non-for-profit organization that is designed to be an indigenous-led visualization of native territories, languages, and treaties. And as you can see, before you can even view this visualization, you have a disclaimer that not only discusses the ownership of the data, but also acknowledges that it's a work in progress. They also increase the likeliness of responsible data use by including a contact page for changes or edits, as well as teaching guides that encourage critical thinking about the visualizations themselves. Let's discuss one more example, because I think this is a great example for those of us who maybe don't think of ourselves as collecting data. So Dear Data was a year-long project with two information designers, Georgia Lupi and Stefani Posovec. And let's not forget they're working in a very male dominated field. So they sent each other hand drawn postcards every week. And on these postcards, they visualized a single aspect of their daily lives. Things like how many doors they opened, what sounds they heard, what they smelled. So not only was this slow scholarship in a sense, they were also really providing a great model for feminist data visualization. Their work has since been obtained by MoMA, and now it's even available in a book. On their website, you can check out those visualizations and find out how to replicate their process if you'd like to try it yourself. So again, that project is called Dear Data. And just really quickly, here are my references for feminist data visualization. Let me pass the mic to Hillary now. So before we wrap things up, we've got a small sort of bonus round for you today. As we were finalizing this webinar, Dr. Hannah McGregor, a scholar of publishing, shared a blog post that we found very timely for the webinar today called Open Access is a Feminist Issue. You might have heard the term open access before, but I'll briefly define it. So the dominant publishing model right now is subscription access, where things like uh, journal articles are only available to those who subscribe to a particular journal or database. 
these kinds of subscriptions are really common for academic institutions like BCU, which means that you have access right now as a student or a faculty member. But for those outside of the institution, like most people in our surrounding communities, if they try to access these resources, they will hit a paywall. That's a term we often use to describe the experience of being denied access to an article or book and instead being accessed, uh, asked to pay out of pocket for it, which isn't possible for many people. Open access publishing is a model whose goal is to break down barriers to accessing research. And as Dr. McGregor points out, if we want to make research articles freely available to all, we have to design new and sustainable financial models that don't require generating revenue through subscriptions. And as we work to design these new models, there are many structural issues in academic institutions that we can't avoid addressing along the way, especially because many of them are feminist issues like whose labor and whose voices are valued. While we won't go further into the topic of open access today, I wanna to share one of the main points that Dr. McGregor makes in her blog post. As publicly funded universities, part of our mission is to facilitate public engagement with our work. And we can't fully do this if we put paywalls around our research. As she says, a feminist research ethics means making our research accessible and accountable. So we, feminist scholars, should be leading the conversation about what it means to do open, accessible, accountable research. We encourage you to read her blog post to learn more, and maybe when you're ready to share your research findings, you can consider publishing in an open access journal too. And I'm always here to answer questions you might have about publishing. And as one more exciting add-on, Hannah McGregor is also the host of the podcast Secret Feminist Agenda, which has several episodes very relevant to our webinar, um, including Bringing Yourself to Work, Slow Down, Doing Feminism in the Classroom, Citing Your Sources, and Living a Feminist Life with Sarah Ahmed. And now I'll pass the mic back to Kelsey to wrap things up. All right, so with all that being said, um, I'm sure there are some running themes that stood out to you about feminist research methods. Uh, for me, I think that we must acknowledge situated knowledge as playing a key role in how we approach our research. It's beneficial even. Not surprising, but power dynamics play an important part in society and therefore feminism and feminist research. And this is all about social justice at the end of the day. How can we work to improve our society through our research? Lastly, there are so many decision points at which you can choose to incorporate feminist practice into your research. Every bit helps. And now we've come to the conclusion of the webinar. And just to wrap everything up, uh, we hope that this was a helpful introduction to incorporating feminist practice in your research. As a reminder, we're all available to discuss these ideas more in depth. You can always reach out to us by email. And with that being said, we'll end the recording and open the floor to questions from you all. Thank you.